Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Loftus, and Mark Raycroft. Thanks for tuning in. Well, everybody, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Wild and Exposed. This week, we have Michael Morrow, Jason Loftus, and myself, Mark Raycroft. We are missing Mr. Hayes. Hope he's doing well tonight. Look forward to seeing him soon, as I'm sure you do as well. Tonight's special guest is Gary Kramer. And wait until you hear what this man has accomplished in his life as a professional photographer. And his latest project is truly mind-blowing what he's accomplished and the details that we'll hear about that I, there's so many questions that we have for him on this immense super high quality publication gary thanks for joining us on the show today how are you hey i'm doing good i appreciate it guys it's nice to meet you kind of in person we can see gary if you tune into our youtube channel wild and exposed podcast so i'm going to just give a little bit of background on gary from the from his book summary so that you can become aware of this man's accomplishments. He's been in the career of photography for a long time and is an award-winning freelance journalist who lives in Willows, California. He has published six books. Get this. He's got me beat here. More than a thousand articles woo, and thousands of photos. His photographs and articles regularly appear in many outdoor magazines and calendars. A native Californian and U.S. Navy Vietnam veteran, Gary earned a Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in wildlife management from Humboldt State University. For 26 years, Gary was a wildlife biologist and refuge manager with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. After a 10-year stint as a refuge manager of the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge Complex, he retired in 1999 to pursue his writing and photography career full-time. In the process of putting this book together, here we go, listen to this. We're going to get into the book, I guess, maybe quickly here. Well, not really. We're going to jump back. I just want to say this because I can't help but Gary visited 40 countries from the Arctic Circle in Alaska to Tierra del Fuego in South America, west to China and South Korea, south to Australia and New Zealand, and east to Morocco and South Africa, and many places in between. You've got to hear about this project. But until then, until we get to that, Gary, what got you into wildlife photography? Well, I think you know the the main thing is that I've always had always had some interest in in water in wildlife, obviously, but what but waterfowl in particular. And you know, like a lot of photographers, I mean, I started out duck hunting. That's really how I got started, and then that kind of progressed into an interest in, in pursuing a career in wildlife management, and which occurred, like you said, I went to Humboldt State, got a couple of degrees, and then I ended up working for the service. And concurrently, I started to do some writing and photography as just a sideline, you know, kind of a way to, you know, they were my hobbies, and here was a way to make a couple of bucks to offset, you know, uh, the expense of that. You know, I had a couple of little kids, I wasn't making much money, and it was kind of a a good way to to get to be able to justify getting away and make a couple bucks and then that eventually I mean it just blossomed over the years and I did more and more and what I found very quickly was is that in writing stories I was far it was a far higher probability of placing that story if I could send them a whole package that is the photos to go along with the writing so pretty soon I figured out well I need to do this so really with no training I just worked on the photography got a little bit better equipment as time went on, and then eventually got to the point to where, after I had 26 years in the, in the Fish and Wildlife Service, an early out opportunity came, came about. And that was if you had 26 years of service at any age, then you could retire and get an annuity immediately. And, it was a, and I figured at that point, I really thought I had enough contacts in the business to kind of make that leap of faith and go full-time writing and photography, and that's been just about 20 years ago, and I've been doing this pretty hardcore ever since. So that's how we got to today, more or less. 
it's such a good story, right? I mean, it's so, and it's so similar to so many people. Everybody starts, well, not everybody, but a lot of people you start out hunting and you determine that you have this love for the outdoors. And then you have this reverence for all these animals. And then you want to just spend more time with them. And the way to do that is to write about it and photograph it. It's just such a common story. And it's pretty cool to hear that uh, that's how you got started. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's like, you know, you have this group of birds, wildlife in general, but this group of birds that you become so, so intimate with in so many ways that it's what you want to do. And I mean, my life has been involved with waterfowl, either through my education, through working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, through writing and photography that, you know, kind of that's what I do. So this book was really kind of the opus of my life, the culmination of 45 years of doing this in some fashion. I figured, well... There's, uh, you know, can I possibly get this thing done? So about four years ago, I just said, yeah, I'm going to do it. And from that point, I never looked back. So how far back, sorry, guys, I'll quit talking here in a minute. But how far back in the book, what did you guys say? I, I don't have a copy of the book in front of me. You guys do. What did you say? There's 1,200 pictures? Well, yeah, the book itself is the ultimate waterfowl guide now i won't say field guide although the images and the maps and the summaries of all all 167 species on planet earth of ducks geese and swans are superbly photographed and summarized in this book it doesn't necessarily doesn't fit in the pack as easily for a field guide but it should yeah, yeah right <laughs> it should be on every member of the audubon society du anybody who loves birds and waterfowl on this planet there are species in here i have never as a biologist never heard of so many of them and it's so interesting to see their images and honestly i mean gary has knocked it out of the park for light he's got them in flight as well as static standing images so you can see the plumage the markings very clearly there's a map for each species this is the penultimate the ultimate guide for waterfowl and we haven't really touted many books on the podcast but truly this this volume is phenomenal and there are over well fi over 500 pages and one shy of 1300 photos according to the statistics right i haven't counted 1299 that must be one of gary's favorite numbers he didn't hit 1300 with but that's i mean where have you seen a book with 1299 color images and 540 pages, over 500, hardcover. Really, it's it's a superb. It, it's you should win a conservation award, in my opinion, for doing this to represent the birds that are currently on planet Earth of waterfowl for ducks, geese, and swans. Because every library, every college, every university, and every enthusiast honestly should have this publication you've done. And what I'm wondering is. How did you come up with the idea? And then, I mean, when you when you think about this, people, the places you Gary traveled to over forty or to, traveled to forty countries in thirty six months. That's three years. So, how? I mean, the hiccups. I can't wait to hear as as we get into the podcast some of the more unique experiences you had. But but to start with, where did you get the idea that this could be done? And, and in a certain amount of time. Well, you know, the thing is, is that because of my interest in waterfowl, I've always kept track of most publications uh, that have to do with waterfowl, either from a scientific standpoint or popular or whatever, kind of the thing that I just keep track of. And there was a book done in 1997 by Frank Todd called The Natural History of the Waterfowl. And it's a book I have. It's a And it was a book that he wrote. He didn't take all the photos. In fact, a lot of them were taken... He, he was the, the, uh, the curator of, the, of, of birds at the San Diego Zoo and San Diego Wild Animal Park. So a lot of those photos really are, are you know, on the edge of a, a concrete pond or whatever. He did write the whole thing, and all the birds of the time were in there. But that's been 25 years ago. And I kind of just said, well, you know, we have some real huge changes in 25 years, both in, in habitat situation, administration of wildlife, um, because of DNA analysis, there's a lot of splitting that occurred. So instead of having 100 and 
35 or so whatever he had, there's 167 because a lot of them have been split. A good example is Canada geese and cackling geese. If you go back 15 years, there was a whole big group of Canada geese that included these four small guys. Well, here about 15 years ago, they split those out, made them cackling geese, and they're a full species. So there's a lot of that that happened. And, um, and also the other thing too is that with photography, that book... While it was a, a at, in the day was a major undertaking, he didn't travel to all those places, and it was slide photography. And I look at the photos in there, and they're not that good. I look at the ones of mine in nineteen ninety seven, and I don't know how I sold any of them. You know, the fact remains is is that it's so much better today with digital photography. So all those things came together. But just before this, about four or five years ago, I did another book called Game Birds, and it was the first coffee table book. It was a photo-driven coffee table book, very similar to this one, and it covered all 34 species of upland game birds in North America. Um, and at that point, nobody had ever photographed them all. You know, the real tough ones, Himalayan snowcock, and then, you know, uh, Atwater prairie chicken, chachalacas, there's a whole bunch of... And then there's 13 introduced subspecies of game birds in Hawaii. And I got all those. Well, I did it kind of almost maybe subconsciously as a precursor to this book. Because next to waterfowl, game birds have always been ducks, I mean, uh, you know, pheasant, quail, grouse, turkeys have been a great interest. So I did that book, and one of the things I wrote in the foreword was, is, you know, my main interest has always been waterfowl. And I kind of took that and said, you know what? The, the, we need to do a new book with digital photography. We need to update everything. And... I like to do things that nobody's ever done. I mean, I'll just be honest about it. And I did the Game Birds book that way. So when I went down this road, luckily I already had virtually all the North American species before the day I started. Now I upgraded those as far as quality, you know, during the course of it. And I had quite a few South American uh, species and a fair amount of African species because I had been both places a number of times bird hunting, both to South America like Argentina in Uruguay, in South Africa, and Botswana, in Africa. And because, you know, duck photography, wildlife photography, I mean, I photographed a lot of lions in Africa, but whenever I saw a duck, it was like, I got to get that photo. So I had a lot going for me that way. And then I just said, look, I'm going to do this. And it's kind of like, when, when I make a list, it's kind of, I hate to make a list because then I got to finish it, right? And it was one of those deals. I set down the road to get this thing done. And... Basically, uh, I went to the uh, International Ornithological Congress, which is a group of worldwide uh, ornithologists, and they actually have a list of all the birds in the world that they have identified. So I just looked at their list, and basically they had the 167, because there's other authorities that might be a little different in the number. But you, you, I grabbed an authority, an ornithological authority, and then I followed that, and I just set a path and said, okay... I'm short on these species, let's say in South America. So then I would plan a trip to Chile, for instance, where I could get maybe, I could improve the images I had of, of more common South American species like yellow-billed pintail and rosy-billed poachards. And if you've ever hunted in Argentina, those are both very common. But there was a bunch of other ones that I didn't have. And I would just set that trip up and go there and and hope for the best so that's kind of how i just i just took chunks and then as i completed that then i would move on and as it went down the road it, the, it became narrower and narrower for me to get the species and i just had to concentrate so it was uh it was it was real methodical as far as picking it and then i got very lucky in most in most cases of getting the photos once i got there well, you answered my question because where I was going to go before was how far back into the files did you have to go to start these, to use the pictures? But if you accomplished it all in the last three years, then not that far back really, right? Because, and then you using digital is the way to go. Yeah, I would say that in the book that I use photos as far as five years back, but I would say that about 85% were taken in the last three years. Because there was a few that, you know, like, for instance, in the chapter on Northern Pintail, I might have had a killer shot that I took five years ago that I really wanted in the book, and that, that was not something that, that held me back. Now, if I got a better Pintail picture, then obviously that would go in. So, And then there was a bunch of species. I mean, the one thing that I, I look back on this and I go, 
you got to realize that number one is I was going oftentimes to a place I had never been. And I'd never been to Madagascar, never been to Ethiopia, you know, never been to Azerbaijan, never, never been to the Central African Republic. So I'm going to a place I've never been to. I'm photographing a duck or a goose I've never seen. I don't know what the weather's going to be like when I get there, and that's critical for a decent photo. And then I had to hire a guide everywhere I went, and I never met this person. So you have these giant four unknowns, and then you just insert yourself in the middle of that, and it's like, you know, hope for the best. And I have to say that it was amazing how well it worked out the majority of the time. I mean, just incredible to me. I mean, look back on it and go, how the hell did that happen? You know, kind of thing. That, that was kind of the gist of, of, of the overall picture of setting the book up. Some of the small places like Madagascar, I mean, was it a challenge to acquire permits or were most of them fairly accessible? I mean, your, your window of time must have been so tight to get the quality of images that are, that are in this book. As you point out, you've got weather and all kinds of other elements. But how tricky was it? for some of the locations as far as permits or the thing is, is that the luckily all but the last year were pre COVID. Yeah. So the restrictions worldwide really weren't that bad. Like for instance, going to Madagascar, there was no special permits required whatsoever. I mean, I just went there, okay. you know, you got to fly there, you got to get a guide, you got to do all the stuff. You know, that's an interesting story because Madagascar is the location of the rarest duck in the world. And that's a story by itself. But, you know, Ethiopia was wide open, so were all these places. There really didn't require any special permits to do most of it because it isn't like I was collecting birds. Um, I was just taking photos of them. And a lot of times when I would hire a local guide, they would have access to places that if I was on my own, I could have never got. So that, that became part of the program to some of these people. And in some cases, like New Zealand is a real good example is in the case of New Zealand, I, I sent an email to the, the Department of Wildlife and said, hey, I'm working on this project, working on this book, Waterfowl of the World, and here's a list of species. And there were two in particular that were very endangered that I wanted to photograph. And I said, can you point me in the right direction? But amazingly enough, and I, got to, and I pat these guys on the back big time in the acknowledgments of the book, is that they sent an email back to me and said, yeah, we, we, we've looked at your website, we really believe in your project. We will assign a biologist to you with a vehicle. You get to our headquarters. He will take you out to take the photos and give you a free place to stay. <laughs> so I mean, how can you beat that? So I roll into New Zealand, uh, flew into Auckland, drove three hours, met a young biologist who was really a cool guy. We had to hike in a number of places that I could have never found in a million years. Photographed the ducks, came back you know, at night, stayed in their quarters. I mean, it was really, really a cool deal to have that kind of assistance and that kind of, and then luckily the weather was decent, so I got all the photos I needed. So a lot of it was, you know, similar to that where I had a contact that really made it easy. I had a similar experience in Australia to where I, uh, a lot of it too, I noticed, I would look on Instagram, for instance, and I would see a just a killer waterfowl photo from a particular country. Let's, let's take Australia. And I'd see who took it, and I'd shoot them a direct message and say, hey, I saw this photo you had of this particular species of waterfowl. Uh, I'm working on this book. Can you point me in the right direction? Same thing. I never asked for anything more than that. And I had a guy, um, name is Barry Baker, from Tasmania, Hobart, Australia, in Tasmania. He, he uh, the next day, he sends me an email back, asked a couple of questions. The second email he sent me, he said, if you come to Australia... I'll guide you for 10 days for free. All you have to do is pay for my expenses. I'll photograph next to you and we'll have a good time. Come to find out he was a PhD, had an environmental consulting firm and a world's expert on albatross. And I went there, landed. He took me to his house, put me up there too nice, fed me. We, we went all over Australia and everywhere we went, he had a local contact that literally took us to the spot. So, I mean, stuff like that happened that was just off the chart amazing as far as making this book happen. And it was, there's a ton of people like that that helped. You know, it was only a couple of very minor bad experiences, but there was a lot of that that went on, in, you know, no matter where I went. So, some places were, 
easy once I got there. On the other hand, there's some places that were at the end of the earth that were impossible to get to and a pain in the ass from start to finish. <laughs> so there was a little bit of everything. So let's hear one of those stories. What was one of those places that was the pain in the ass? The biggest pain in the ass in the entire book. There's a duck called a Salvatore's Teal. It's found only in the mountains of, of Papua New Guinea. And when I looked on the internet doing my research, because another thing that was real important is that this book couldn't have been done without the internet. Because I was able to contact people, that, you know, these guides and so on. I was able to do research. Can you imagine the days of a telephone or a fax? You know, you couldn't have done it. So really, the digital photography and the internet made this physically possible to do. But when I looked on the internet for Salvatore's Teal, which nobody ever even heard of, there was not one single what I would call professional level photo that even existed. It just doesn't exist. There were photos of the duck through a spotting scope, you know, where you put the camera up to a spotting scope and take the picture and it's a poor quality. And there were also some photos that were taken so far away and cropped so heavily that they were just super fuzzy. So there was no real good ones. So that was a trip. I had to go to Australia first. I had a buddy of mine go with me. Flew to Australia, photographed there for about 10 days, and then we flew from Australia to Port Moresby, New Guinea, which is the capital. From there, you have to take a flight to this mining town called Tabubal, which is up in the mountains. There's a flight every day, but only two a week make it because the weather's so horrible. It's raining and foggy and nasty and everything. So we fly up there, got there the first shot, and I hired a guide there of somewhat of a local celebrity because um, he had guided uh, Sir David Attenborough for, for the, if you've ever seen the special on Birds of Paradise by, uh, on the BBC by Attenborough, this guy, he was the guide for, for, for Attenborough. So he was my guide, but of course he didn't, wasn't my guide. I got there and he goes, well, I'm going to give you these two young guys. So he was, I just met him. So I got a beat up old Land Rover and these two pretty young guys started to drive around the roads in the first afternoon when we saw a pair of birds. They're a riverine species. They never are found in flocks. There are very few of them. And, but here we go. I mean, the first hour we find a pair. From a dirt road, they were about 150 yards or 100 yards away. We get out of the car, they fly away. I mean, so quickly we found out that yeah, no wonder there's no pictures. They're not hard to find once you get there. There aren't a lot of them, but we did find them every day. But, it, but in, in Papua New Guinea, everybody over the age of five has a gun or a slingshot or some weapon. And if it has plumes on it, they shoot it for plumes. And if they can eat it, they eat it. I mean, I've never seen a place where people are so, I mean, they're living off the land. So these ducks have been persecuted forever. And they're just super wary. So the only way we figured out that we could get a photo of them was that we'd have to see them during the day and that these rivers are, 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 are jungle to the, to the bank. So we had to go in, we'd find the birds and then we'd go in at night, set up a blind on the edge of the river and I'd get in the blind and, you know, we'd just, I, well, me, I'd just sit there and sit there and sit there. One of the days we're going in at night, we got these two young guys with machetes chopping through the jungle, headlamps on, and all of a sudden they hit what later on we found out was an ant nest. And it was just like in the movies that we were swarmed in the middle of the night with, the, with these ants and they were inside our clothes, they were biting us on our face. It was like, you know, like a scene out of a horror movie. So we get through that and I asked the guy, you know, I said, what, what just happened? He said, well, I must have hit an ant nest, he says, and they're called electric ants because every time they bite you, it's like an electric shock. And that's exactly what it was. A long story short, I spent six days, 10 hours a day, 60 hours in a blind for four minutes of photography of two birds. And that my entire trip, I went every day, we'd, I'd get in the blind and every day one thing or another would happen. One day I'm in the blind and next thing I know, I hear a chainsaw fire up and about five people show up in a slash and bury agriculture. They're cutting the forest down right next to the place I picked to wait for these ducks. You know, so it was, you know, it was just crazy what went on. But what, what that one was is that it was a long, long trip to a place I never wanted to go back. And about day five, I'm going, I am, I'm going to have to come back. So <laughs> afternoon, day five, 
after 10 hours every day, it rained about half the time. I'm sitting in, in a blind, and all of a sudden I see two of these ducks drifting down river, coming right at me. And then they disappear behind a rock, and I go, oh, my God, this is going to happen to me again. But about five minutes later, they came out from behind the rock, drifted down, and they got off on a sandbar right in front of me for about four minutes. And I hammered down as many photos as I could possibly take. They swam away. That was my entire, well, we were there seven days, four minutes of photography. So that was one of the ones that was tough. And I do have now, and it's in the book, if you look at the Salvatore Seal, they still aren't the best in the book, but I would call them acceptable professional level photos of the Salvatore Seal. And some of these hardcore birders, it's like one of the most ultimate things they could ever do was even see one. And I finally got the photos after, after going for them. So that was, that was a cool deal. That, see, that's the, sometimes it's the hardest, hardest things that make the coolest stories, right? Yeah, or yeah, at least you right. remember it the most. Absolutely. I mean, I'll never forget that because it was so, everything about it was difficult, you know, and then the, the payoff was getting the photos and then we got to fly out. I mean, that we went in on a flight and got out on a flight. There was only three flights that whole week, I think. So we were lucky in every regard and it rained about half the time. But I mean, I was, I didn't have to photograph in the rain. The day I photographed and it wasn't raining. So it was, it was really a good deal overall. You must have had your lucky rabbit's foot with you. Yeah, I had something, you know, <laughs> had something that worked. Is there one species that was like a menace that was just, you know, you just couldn't get? Or was there a species you had to go back multiple times to try to capture? Or was that the one that was the most difficult? Well, I, there were both of those things, actually. The one that I had to go back for multiple times and I finally got was the red-breasted goose. And it, of all the geese, they're a little guy like a cackler, small goose, um, and they, they breed in, in Siberia, and most of them winter in Eastern Europe. The biggest populations are in Romania and, uh, and Bulgaria. And I actually ended up having to go there three times uh, to get those. I mean, the first time I went, it was a real cold winter, and they migrated a little bit further south, and they weren't there in any numbers to photograph. And the second time I went, it was a real, you know, warm winter, so they stayed a little further north, and finally I was able to to get some birds on the third trip. So that was a that was really the only repeat. I did some repeats, but it wasn't because I lacked photos. It was to fill out ones that I had or get a species that I just didn't concentrate. Like England, for instance, I went to England three times. And every time I went there, I got a, more of the same to improve that. And then I got maybe one or two new ones. You know, like, I, like for instance, I, I went to Scotland. I hadn't got the uh, velvet scoter which is the European counterpart of the white wing scoter. And I had been on two previous trips to different places, but I finally got them on the third trip. But as far as not getting them, the one that was the biggest nemesis of the whole thing, and I, and I have a photographer's notes in the back of the book, and it kind of tells the story of, you know, what occurred uh, during the course of getting these photos. But the one that was the nemesis of them all, and I did not get the photos in the end. I do have photos in the book, but it's some of the very, very few that are by somebody else. And that was, it's a, it's a, it's a bird called an Eaton's pintail. If we would go back 25 years before all this splitting occurred, it would have been a subspecies of the northern pintail, of our pintail. And because I only did full species in the books, although every chapter and every duck or goose that has subspecies, they're spelled out in the book. So the seven subspecies of Canada's, I talk about the seven, I talk about their size, I talk about where they're found. So that's in there, but as far as all seven of those having an individual chapter, they don't. There's one chapter for Canada geese. So it ended up being that this Eaton's pintail 20-some years ago was split out and became a full species. Northern pintail's it, it, scientific name is Anis acuta, and this one is Anis eatoni. It's found on two sub-Antarctic islands that are closer to Antarctica than anywhere in the middle of the uh, of the ocean. It's too far from land for a helicopter. There's no airstrip there. And it's owned by the French. And the French, there's about 100 researchers there. Uh, that's a weather station and so on. And it's the largest. If you've ever eaten Chilean sea bass, the real name is Patagonian toothfish. That's what they really are. I mean, the, the, the name they sell them by is Chilean sea bass. The largest fishery in the world is there, so they have some fisheries biologists. 
It has a million king penguins on it. The, 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 uh, the southern elephant seals are there. So it's kind of a natural history, uh, you know, location. The only way you get there is there's three cruises a year on a supply ship. The supply ship takes 12 civilians on each trip. And for a single berth, it costs $20,000 to go there. I applied three different times for scientific permits. The first time I applied for a scientific permit to go there, told them about the book, so on and so forth. And the, the answer was, a no, we're not interested. They gave me no particular reason whatsoever. The second try was another one, and I said, look, I am willing to pay you the $20,000 to go there to get one duck. Because at that time, it was the only one that I, that I figured I wasn't going to get. And they said, well, sorry, we're not interested. They gave me no reason whatsoever to do it. The third try was is that you would think that for the 12 spaces on the ship, it would be a lottery. Wrong. What it is is that at noon Paris time on a certain day, you have to get online and type your name in. And that goes in, and it's based on how quick after they open the application that you get on the list, right? And if you're 1 through 12, then you you can pay your 20000 If If you share a berth with somebody, then it's half that amount, right? But I didn't have anybody that was willing to spend ten grand, so <laughs> I was going to have to bank it by myself. <laughs> so, so I'm ready to do this, right? Well, guess what? Noon Paris time is 3 o'clock in the morning in California. And, and prior to that, I had, I had done a bunch of research, and I had a French biologist that I said, look, this is going to be tough. Can you be on the phone with me when I try to get this thing done? My office assistant, I had her come in at 3 o'clock in the morning because she's way better, as you guys found out with this computer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's sitting next to me. So pretty soon the screen pops up. And we type in all the information and hit send, right? Well, in about five minutes, it pops back that it's unaccepted. Type it in again. Now I'm wasting time because I know this is a time sensitive. It's not a lottery, which it ought to be. It's a time sensitive thing. I type in again. It comes back. I, I'm on the phone with my guy in France and I said, what do you think? He says, well, he says, there's a possibility it has, to, and we use a translator, right? We're using a translator. To, t to do all this in, he says, maybe it needs to be keystroked in French. Guess what? I give him the information, he keystrokes it in French. You can't do it in English and do a translator. It has to be keystroked in French. I mean, you know, how's that going to happen unless you're French? So we do that, it gets accepted. About, a, about 10 days later, I get, a, I get a letter that says, or an email that says, sorry, you're number 22, you can't go. Then, adding insult to injury, it says after that, oh, by the way, starting with the trip that you applied for, in order for you to get on the boat, you have to speak fluent French. Oh. <laughs> if you can believe that. So even if I would have made the cut, uh, so there was three tries. The next thing I tried to do is that I went to the French embassy in San Francisco and talked to their science attache. I got a hold of our embassy in Paris and I was going down the political road. I was going to get a hold of the State Department because I, I got I had a couple of people that I thought could get me through some political stuff. And then COVID hit. And then obviously there's nobody in the world going to go there once COVID hit. So I did not get the Eaton's pintail as much as I tried. And I and I ham in the photographer's notes. I hammer those people by name. <laughs> I call them out by name. The two people that turned me down. And the last letter I wrote to the guy, I said to him. I said, I said, as a fellow biologist, you have to realize this is the only thing, the only bird I'm not going to have for what is going to be an ornithological piece of, uh, of um, uh, literature. And, and it's something that nobody's ever done. And it's something that I've been trying to do for the last 50 years was get all these ducks. He never even answered me. So, I mean, it just blew me away that 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 occurred. It's just too bad that COVID hit because I think I knew some people uh, in government, in our government that could have put some, put the hammer on them a little bit and said, look, you're not giving this guy any kind of reason. They just didn't want to be bothered. 
I even went so far that attache in San Francisco from the French Embassy gave me the names of two researchers that were working on, on sea lions and elephant seals, and I contacted those guys saying, hey, can I come in under your permits? One of them didn't answer me, and the other guy said, well, you know, I don't think so because the, the higher-ups make all the decisions, and we're afraid that if we start to buck them, they're going to jerk our permits. <laughs> so that was one that was a big disappointment. I did get the photos from somebody else, so they're in the book. I wrote the chapter on it. There's a description of it, and I hammered down on the two idiots that didn't let me go. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was a tough one. That's incredible. That is. That's a good story. <laughs> so out of all that, what's your favorite species? Like the yeah. like the favorite experience. Well, the favorite experience. Well, I, I can. That's easier than the favorite species because I have a lot of favorites. I have two favorite. The, the two experiences that were by far the most productive. One of them was very unique. In May of twenty, in the midst of COVID, prior vaccinations, the world was shut down. Right. I needed to go to Iceland because there's a number of species that migrate from Europe to breed in Iceland, as well as species from North America that go there. So it's a really a outstanding melting pot biologically for a bunch of ducks and geese uh, for me to photograph. But the, the problem is, is that there's only about a four week window from the time they get there until, or maybe six weeks at the most, that the hens are sitting on eggs. And once that occurs, the males are gone, they start molting, it's a no go. So really you have about a 30 to 40 day window. So it just so happened, I had a trip there planned, got totally shut down with COVID because there was no entry into COVID at all. I mean, no entry into Iceland due to COVID. But only about a month before I was going to go, after I had canceled all my reservations, air and everything was, was put away, I looked on the internet by accident. I don't know how where I found it. I saw that Iceland was giving out special permits for movie crews because apparently they, they, they film a lot of movies there. And for scientists and for journalists. So I go, well, I'm going to give this a shot. And I wrote an email to the email address that I saw, and I told them that I was working on this book and that I qualified as a scientist and biologist as well as a journalist. And that I, and this was very time sensitive that I only could go prior to the 10th of June. Basically, the 15th of, of May to the 10th of June was the time frame. That was Sunday night. Monday, I got a, a letter back, email, that said, we've, we've received your request. The next day, 24 hours later, I got an email that said, your request has been approved. And 24 hours after that, I got a letter signed by the, depart by the, the head of the Foreign Affairs Office giving me carte blanche access to Iceland. So, I, and I, so there was one flight per week out of Boston, Fly to Boston, get on, it was an Iceland air flight, get on the airplane, which normally takes 300 people. There were seven of us on the airplane. Flew to Reykjavik, got there, went up to the customs booth, gave them my letter and my passport, and the guy said, I don't know how you did this, but welcome to Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I rented a car, went on my way, and everywhere I went, they said, you know, we haven't seen anybody from outside Iceland in the last, you know, many, many months. And we haven't seen an American, you know, and it was always a big question. But I managed to spend 10 days there and got just incredible photos. Like the many of the photos are the harlequin ducks I took there. Um, same thing with long-tailed ducks. Uh, same thing with common scoters, which is the counterpart of our black scoter. Uh, just a bunch of species. And the other thing was, there, you know, it's quite popular for bird watchers normally, but there was nobody there. I mean, I had literally had the place to myself and I had rented, uh, you know, just a little cabin to stay in prior to COVID. And, and they were going to charge me 900 for the week. When I got there, they charged me 350 for the same room because there's nobody showing up and they were starving to death. So that that was a deal to where it really, really worked out. And that became memorable from the standpoint of how how fortunate that was, the number of species that I got, the weather was good, and the birds in the spring there, I mean, literally, sometimes they were so close. You know, I'm usually fighting with distance. That's that's the biggest issue. I'm fighting with distance, so I'm using a 600 millimeter. I always wish I had more lens, and, you know, you can't do that. But in this case, I didn't have to worry about that because in the springtime, they're, they're quite 
habituated more so than they are other times of the year. So that was an incredibly memorable trip in every regard. The second best one of the entire trip was to Punta Arenas, Chile. And that's at the very, that's Tierra del Fuego, but on the Chile side. And I flew there, had an excellent guide who was really a biologist by trade. Um, that was, this was pre-COVID. And there was a number of species that I had never even seen. And I was able to get them all. The weather was, was relatively good the whole time. Uh, it was just, there was just no hitches at all. And that one was the most, I think I got 12 or 13 species out of one trip, which was the record for any particular single trip. So those were two that were really, you know, the one in Iceland I guided myself uh, and managed to do it. And the one in, in Chile, I had a, probably one of the best guides of the whole trip. So those were just outstanding for me. Yeah, it's not often you travel internationally and get the whole plane to yourself. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was something. And that, I mean, you know, that just shows how efficient, you know, maybe I hit it right or what I did, but that was the, that was the level of efficiency you just don't see in most governments. You know, it was one day at 24, 24, and 24. Three days later, I had a permit. Yeah, absolutely. So that was, that was really good. My wife thinks that, that the uh, King Eider is evidence that there are aliens among us. Would you agree? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a goofy-looking duck, but boy, it sure is beautiful. I think it's okay. one of the, the most beautiful ducks there is. There are so many in well, this and th Those shots I got, the, the place to get King Eiders, they're very widespread. They're, found, they're circumpolar in distribution. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, so they're 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 surprisingly widespread. But the real place that most people get their shots, and I did too, was in. I got some of them, the majority of them in Barrow, Alaska, but I also got some in Norway. Uh, so I got them in both places. But it's a very cool duck. So once you got all your pictures, how long did it take to compile all of this stuff into this form into the book itself? Well, you know, the thing is, the real challenge, I, you know, the, the text part is, is really Internet research. I mean, there's a little bit of, of some original research that I did on Brandt, because that's what I did my graduate work on was Black Brandt that migrate from Alaska to Mexico, and some of that original research is in there. But generally what it was is that just hours and hours and hours of trying to, to get all this Internet information and, and then make it concise so people could understand it. So the photos, I, I had to do a lot of traveling. And basically what happened with the, with the writing part is that I did have uh, 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 Greg Menzik, who was a biologist that worked for me at, at Sacramento uh, National Wildlife Refuge, uh, has edited a couple of my past books. And I asked him to help me put some of the chapters together, which he did. But by and large, what it boiled down to is just every time I was on an airplane, Every night that I was in a hotel, I mean, you know, I'd get back at, you know, somewhere that when it got dark at 5 o'clock, I'd have dinner at 5.30, and I'd write till 11 at night. So I had a laptop with me continually, and as long as I had Internet access, which I frankly did almost everywhere, I mean, even Internet access in the, in the middle of the jungle in, in, uh, in, the, in the Central African Republic there, at the lodge they had Internet access, it was slow. But as long as I could get to the Internet, I would pick off – several chapters and try to complete those at least in a rough format while I was on the road, then I'd get home and I'd be much more precise and fill in the blanks. A lot of it was, and, and what, what I finally did, I mean, this book was designed originally as a photo-driven coffee table book, and that's still what it is. But what ended up during the course of writing it is that by gathering all this biological information, it really is the only place I believe you can go find out what the color of an egg of a freckle duck is in in Australia. So there's some real commonalities biologically. You can tell what I, we describe what the bird looks like, you know, how much it weighs, what the wingspan is, you know, uh, what it, what's its size, what the distribution is, uh, what kind of habitat it's in, the breeding biology of the bird, what it eats, and then current status of the bird endangered, not endangered, you know, there's jillions of them like snow geese or whatever. So it really became biologically um, much more complete than I envisioned in the very beginning just by virtue of going through, finding out, well, I got to include that, and I got to include that. And once you do that with one, one chapter and one species, you got to do it with all 167. And that's what, what I learned partway through the book. So I actually had to go back 
and look at some of the early chapters and then add stuff to it because now you have this, there's a protocol set up for what needs to be in each chapter. And, and then I had it peer reviewed. It was peer reviewed by three different biologists, two in the U.S. Um, and then one in England. So I had it peer reviewed and then I had the whole thing, every single word. And I had another guy who's, a, who's an expert look at every photo. And I said, look, I mean, I think I got all these right, but I got to have somebody look at it to make sure that I, because they're like, for instance, you know, a female um, of some of the ruddy duck type species, they look almost identical. Uh, and, and like in Argentina, there's even a little overlap in two of those species. So you got to be sure. So I had that, that reviewed. So it was looked at by a lot of people. And then when there were some very specific chapters that I wanted to get further review, that I had an expert for that particular duck or goose review that chapter. Like the Brazilian merganser is the second rarest duck in the world. And there's a guy in Brazil that's a world expert on this duck. And he's the guy that reviewed that chapter. So there was a lot of that going on to get, to get the text the way it is. And it, it appears that it's being considered for um, at least a supplemental text at UC Davis and Yale University for their ornithology classes. So, you know, and then uh, Dr. John Eady at UC Davis, which is really one of the foremost researchers, uh, Waterfeld Research, he wrote the foreword, one of the forewords, and did a real nice job. So I think that the, that the, the academic community will hopefully embrace it as well as, you know, I mean, let's face it, it's going to be sold mostly to duck hunters first. And then secondarily, I think to you know bird watchers and that, and then third to, to academia. So I think I think it hits all the the different markets out there. Hopefully, I think you're the modern day waterfowl Roosevelt. I don't know about that, but <laughs> you know, I was out there doing it. And I took lots of. I mean, I took I don't know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of photos to get the nearly thirteen hundred that are in the book because you know you throw some you know with with digital it's a lot of deleting. But then the tough part was that some of these species, like northern pintail, you know, I have thousands of photos. How do you pick the tinner in the book? That was tough. On the other hand, Salvatore's teal, I had like about 30. So it wasn't so tough to pick the tin. <laughs> so it, it, was a, it, was a, it was just a process that, you know, one step at a time. And it was a lot of photographing time and a lot of time on airplanes writing. And, you know, but it, 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 got, it was finished. So that's the main thing. <laughs> And it just arrived. I can't wait to see it. A month ago, incredible. right? It just arrived. It just it's just finished. Just printed. You just got your copies. Yeah, I just I've had them for less than a month. So was this self published, or did you work through a publisher? Well, what I did is it's kind of a unique. the The, the concept and business model is pretty unique in the way it worked out. Is that technically I self published it, but what happened is is that uh, well the, the the I ended up. I, the estimate that I had, I mean, it's a giant book. I mean, it's much bigger than, than, than most books will ever be size-wise. So basically, what it ended up being is that the estimate I, ha I had for the design and the publication, the printing, and the shipping, because it was printed in Hong Kong, the shipping back was about $100,000. So what I did with that is that I, I went out and I made... I did a, a self campaign of raising money to ra try to raise $100,000 of donations to get this book published. And I went to people that I knew, you know, through the Fish and Wildlife Service. I mean, frankly, this thing is, is pretty much funded by duck hunters. You know, people that I know either through the service or through, you know, my writing and photography. And I went to some people and said, hey, I'm working on this project. Would you be willing to donate some money? And I made sure they didn't donate it to me. I went to the California Waterfowl Association, which is a state, you know, organization of waterfowl hunters, the state counterpart of DU, if you will, or Delta, right? And I, I asked them if they would accept the money so that these folks could put it in. They could put the money, send the money to CWA, and it became a tax-free donation. So these guys would get something back out of it. And the whole idea was is to get that money into California waterfowl. Then they paid the publisher when, you know, when the bill showed up. So that, so that I wasn't, I, I said, look, I don't want the money. I want you to go ahead and, and give it to CWA, which I did. And I ended up raising $105,000. 
So that part of the book became paid for by donations. As a result of that, what I decided to do is that if any conservation organization, Delta, Ducks Unlimited, Wildfowl Trust in England, um, DU, CWA, Audubon Society, I'll give them the book for free. Here's a book. Here's a $90 book. You can have it for free. Because I don't have to get money up front because I don't have money invested in it up front. And then they sell that book for 90 bucks. They keep 45, do good things with wild, for, for waterfowl. I get 45 back to reimburse my travel expenses. I kept track of every cup of coffee that I ever spent, every dime. My travel expenses out of my pocket was $163,000. So it's a quarter million dollar project, really. Of 100000 donated, the 163 I financed, and then I, my, me or, or Greg Menzik that helped me, we, we took nothing out of it. So what my goal at the end of the day is, is that this is really the culmination of my life's work, and I wanted to try to give something back to these organizations. Uh, and already I've, those organizations have sold a bunch of books and are making money, and I'm getting some back towards my travel. So the idea is at the end of the day to break even, uh, on this book. It isn't going to be a big money maker. Uh, I'll make a little bit of money at the end of the day because I also did, the standard edition is $90, but I did a limited edition which has a slip case and then a leather-like cover with gold lettering on it, and it's 250 bucks. and I make some money on those. And I did, it was, it's numbered 1 through 250, and it's 250 each. And believe it or not, I thought those would sell at maybe 70, 80 to 1, I'm selling them at much less than that, and I've sold already 100 of them. So I'm not going to make much on the standard edition, but on the 250, I'll make a little bit. But it wasn't ever intended to be, you know, a big money maker. It was just once I set that goal to get it done, I wanted to get it done, and I did want the organizations. I mean, I've been, you know, uh, Waterfowl has been my thing forever. So why not try to make some money, you know, break even, make a little bit of money for me and put some money into conservation. So that's the way it worked out. And, and, and everybody's embracing. I mean, DU's all over this thing. Uh, Delta just did an interview the other day. California Waterfowl Association has already, um, you know, sold well over 100 books and just asked for another 100. So it, it's moving. And I, I'm just really happy about that. So what is it about waterfowl? So... One of my one of our good buddies of the podcast, Doug Gardner, um, he's a waterfowl. He's a certified waterfowl nut, which I would kind of put you in that category too, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, and he's a filmmaker, so he shoots tons of stuff for BBC. I've worked with him on some projects, and he's always said, "Man, I just want to do a waterfowl project." And whenever we take that project to somebody to say, "Hey, what do you think about this?" you don't get that response. If you take a bear project or a big predator project, they're all over it, right? But waterfowl has its own special just thing about it. It's so cool. It's nothing cooler than watching a, a flock of ducks coming in and the way that they fight, the, or don't fight the wind, the way they use the wind and the way they they just do their thing, right? It's just m magic. What is it for you that, what's that intrigue? What's that? pool that made waterfowl that life passion or that life's work well i mean it's kind of twofold for me i mean one is is that from a biological standpoint i worked for the blm for about a year when i first got out of college and then transferred over fish and wildlife service because at the time fish and wildlife service wasn't hiring so i worked for the blm and what i kind of found there from a biological standpoint is that you do something in the sagebrush to see any results, it may take you 25 years or however long. You do something in the forest, it'll take longer. But one thing about a wetland is, is that you can make an effective change in a single season and certainly in two. So there's, it, it's very dynamic in the way that, that that ecosystem works compared to a lot of other ecosystems. So biologically, I always had an intrigue with the way you could actually, you know, on the National Wildlife Refuge System, there's a lot of manipulation that we do habitat-wise to improve the habitat for waterfowl for a higher carrying capacity, like here in the Central Valley, where there's lots and lots of waterfowl. I mean, on the refuge system I managed here, the complex, we, we wintered two million ducks and, you know, three quarters of a million geese on 35,000 acres. So you have to have every acre with giant output of food and, 
and habitat. So that always intrigued me. The other thing is, is that, you know, from a hunting standpoint where I started, waterfowl to me were always the greatest challenge. You know, it was like, you just can't go out there. I mean, if, you know, pheasant hunting's great. And if you got a dog, it's even better, but you know, you really need, and it, you can do it without a dog, but, but with duck hunting and goose hunting, you need the decoys. You need, you, you got to play the weather. You, there's a lot more to it in my mind then there is some, I mean, I love to hunt all upling, all birds, but ducks was always this extra allure. Plus, really, if you look at them, the variety always intrigued me. Even in, in the U.S., there's 46 species, you know, plus. Uh, you can go places in California and certainly in Mexico where you can shoot, you know, 10 species a day. So there's a lot of variety. And just the way they, they come to the decoys, it just, it just became... It just became this interest, which which I pursued, you know, in different, you know, these different directions over the years. So I think it's a combination of all those. It's the habitat that they're in and how dynamic that is. It's the way the birds, you know, behave in a hunting scenario. It's the beauty of them just in general, and it's the species diversity. So you kind of have all those elements that you really don't have in many other groups of even wildlife, let alone birds. So I think it's kind of all that stuff. Or maybe I'm just maybe I'm just goofy for ducks somehow. I don't know. Well, you're a certified waterfowl nut. Yeah. So what what's the biggest obstacle out there right now for waterfowl in the U.S. Let's say. Well, I think you know the thing is is that waterfowl. A good example of you know not this past summer but the summer before during the midst of COVID, I went to North Dakota and spent three weeks photographing. And it was directed at, you know, uh, female with ducklings. And it was one of the wettest years we've had in 25, and the, it was incredible. Well, here this year rolls around, and you have one of the driest years on the prairies we've had in another 25 years. So one year to the next, you have this dynamic situation that we can't do anything about. So that's a factor that's just always going to be there. But I think, you know, over the years... What has been obvious, and whether it be here in the Central Valley of California or whether it be in the prairies, is the loss of habitat. And the way you know that's, and if you look at any wildlife population, that usually is is it's not about shooting them, and it's not about running into power lines, and it's not about a deer getting run over by a car. It's about the habitat where they where they live, and I think that's been impacted both in the prairies and and in the wintering areas, uh, for one. Um, and there's been stuff done about that. DU Delta has done a lot in Canada. I mean, here in California, there's actually more wetlands now than there was 30 years ago due to uh, the Central Valley Joint Venture, which is a conglomeration of, of um, you know, California Game and Fish, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Audubon, uh, so on and so forth, all these conservation organizations to actually uh, increase habitat. So, so that's, that's occurred. The other thing is is that let's face it of all the of all the hunting groups duck hunters spend the most money. I mean certainly you know Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation elk hunters spend money right no no doubt about it same with same with the Turkey Federation but if you look at the duck hunters every single year they got to buy an expensive duck stamp expensive license it isn't an elk hunt once in a while like a guy going to Montana that does it every five years it's every single year. They spend a lot of money. They donate more money per capita than any than anybody else. And as you lose hunters, you lose that dollar incentive, that, that dollars that goes into conservation. If you have a lot less hunters, they're not putting into DU, Delta, and so on and so forth. They're not buying ammunition. They're not buying guns. All the, there's, there's money generated for conservation in all those aspects. So that's, that's a bit of an issue is how do we retain hunters and 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 even try to increase that. So I think it's habitat. Um, I think it's 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 loss of some hunters, and I think it's just mother nature when it comes to ducks. You know, it's no different than a real hard winter for for deer or elk that you know they'll suffer. Uh, so it's a little bit of all that. So those are all challenges that that I think a lot of us are uh, you know in some ways are, are trying to meet that. Um, and we'll see what happens. I mean, thank God duck hunters. Or there's a lot of hardcore duck hunters that want to see this sport continue, and they realize that habitat is really the key, so they don't mind, you know, putting up money for their duck stamp, which the majority of that goes to buy, 
by habitat. I mean, the refuges that I managed here, Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge that was established in 1932 um, during the Depression was bought with duck stamps, you know, and some other funds, but duck stamps were involved. So, you know, it's still going for a good cause. Well, that's one of the things I think we tell people all the time. Even if you're not a hunter, you could go out and buy a license, which is going to support whatever in that state or that, you know, and that duck stamp is one of the best things, right? Because you can buy a yeah, absolutely. national duck stamp. And I know here in Colorado, you can buy a Colorado duck stamp. I don't know if it's that way in every state, but that's one way to just say, hey, here's my contribution to, you know, I'm out here using the resource as a photographer and photograph them just because they're so beautiful here's my little way to put towards this this effort yeah absolutely and that's a, a real good way to do it you buy a federal duck stamps 25 bucks most states have duck stamps it goes for habitat as well you know and then, and then there's donations to du and delta and there's a bunch of state waterfowl organizations as well so i think as duck hunters we kind of do our part and uh, but you can always do more right oh yeah well, especially with the habitat loss, till that starts changing, which it never will. I mean, there's always going to be a need, right? Right, right, right. So what's next? Now that you've accomplished this huge endeavor, what do you have a, something else in your sights? Do you have something else? I mean, do you photograph well, everything now? Well, you know, the main thing is, is right now, you know, uh, I'm trying to market this thing and move them, and it's been really frustrating because uh, of the supply chain thing, right? So this happened to, you know, I was right in the midst of COVID, right in the midst of this thing. And luckily I got a, a, a shipment of standard edition books uh, that, that I've been selling, but the limited edition and the balance of the standard haven't got here yet. Um, so, and I got a bunch of orders for limited. So those people are starting to send me emails saying, hey, where's my book? But so the first thing, I'm trying to really market these books. And then you got to realize that for the last four years, I've done nothing else but this. And most of my other, you know, other things I do is that I do take photos of deer and elk and moose and all that for calendars and, and some magazines. And I just haven't done that. So I need to catch up on that. Then the other thing too, that, that I do is that I lead a lot of photo safaris. I do, um, in fact, it's become prior to COVID a fair part of my business that I lead photo safaris to Africa like I'll take a group, I'll set up the whole trip, and we'll do a two-week photo safari in Africa. I also do the Galapagos. I also do India for tigers. In fact, I got a group of eight going to India in, in March to photograph tigers. And then I also do jaguars in Brazil. So that's coming back online because I have a lot of rollover trips that were canceled during COVID. So really in the near, near future, those are the two things I'll concentrate on. And I'm just not sure. You know, I, I, I'll never retire. I mean, I can't imagine not doing this until I can't do it. So something will come up, but I'm just not quite sure at this point what that's going to be. Still got the spark. This is, this is an incredible, incredible volume and highly recommended reference tool for anybody who has the slightest interest in, in waterfowl, waterfowl of the world. So, Gary... How can people source this from you who are listening? Well, I think that the, the very best way to do it is, is that uh, I've set it up on my, go to my website, which is Gary, G-A-R-Y, Kramer with a K, K-R-A-M-E-R dot net. So if you go to Gary Kramer dot net and then you go to books, you'll find it on the, uh, the first, you know, couple there. And then you just click on that. It gives a description of the book. It has some sample pages. I put a bunch of sample pages so people can see what the interior looks like. And then there's a PayPal button, real simple. You just go there, hit the PayPal button. That sends the order to me. And then what I'll do is I get that order and I turn it around with the standard anyways, because I have them uh, right away. I send it out media mail and it takes about, well, Christmas was slow, but generally it takes about a week to get there. So that's really, so GaryKramer.net and then order it on my website. It's it's ninety dollars for the book and then nine dollars for shipping and handling, which I just barely break even because the actual postage is seven dollars and sixty cents and the box costs a buck. So and I gotta put it in the box. So it ends up being that's just a push. But it's uh, it's it's ninety dollars for the book and, and we'll get it out to you. And and everyone that comes from me direct, um, I sign 
Uh, so it's a signed copy of that book. So that's that's really the best way. At some point, uh, I mean, you can buy it from California Waterfowl Association and some of the organizations. So either way, for me, direct or some of the organizations. I was fortunate enough to get a copy, and I can vouch for the fact that it's if you have them in stock, it's a very quick turnaround. I think I actually had mine in my hand within about five days from when I ordered it. Um, and I'll tell you what, man, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Um, I'm definitely a, I don't know if I'm a waterfowl nut like you, but I definitely love waterfowl. I love the challenge of photographing them. I love the challenge of hunting them as well. And this, this book is exhaustive and it's amazing. The photos are amazing. The information that's amazing. It's something that I'll cherish and, and reference to multiple times throughout the rest of my time, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I, I really am honored to be able to chat with you tonight and glad to have a copy in my hands too. So I appreciate getting the opportunity to chat with you and meet you. And hopefully someday I may even be able to come over there and bug you in the central Valley and maybe photograph by you. That'd be a, that'd be yeah. a real pleasure. So <laughs> anytime, you know, one of the reasons why when I retired, I stayed here is that within about a 45 minute drive, I had six state and federal areas that have outstanding photography so, you know, I kind of look out, get up at five o'clock, look outside. If the weather's raining, I go back to bed. And if it's a good, good day, then I go take photos. <laughs> but that was before I did all this traveling. So I'm kind of back doing that. Nice. And I appreciate, you know, Jason, you saying that because it was really, this is, it's something that I, I, I don't know if I've always wanted to do it, but once I set down the path, I'm, I'm glad I got it done because along the way, there was a couple of times I go, what have I possibly done here? <laughs> I've got all this money invested in. You know, it's just, but, you know, it, it came to pass and, and I have something that I'm pretty proud of. Yeah. Well, you should be. I wanted to ask you, you know, we talked a lot about all the data or all that material that you wrote. And then you see all these really cool pictures, but there's this whole other element of audio. And some of the the sounds that these birds make is just incredible. What's one of the your favorite vocalizations that you heard from all of these species that you photographed, and, you know, cause I hear, I can pick out a few of them when I hear them flying overhead. It's like, that was this or that, but they're pretty, you know, I guess common cause we hear them a lot traveling the world. Like you did, what's some of those really cool sounds that you heard? Well, you know, the thing is, you know, geese generally are the most vocal. So really most of the geese around the world, um, you know, make, make, you know, pretty loud and, and pretty cool sounds. But some of them, it, it, one of the, the groups of, of ducks and geese in the book that we, most people here don't even know about is shell ducks and shell geese. And they're a group, what, what the, the book is broke down into whistling ducks is like one group of ducks, like the black-bellied whistling duck or the fulvous whistling duck that we have. We, we used to call them tree ducks, but, you know, they're whistling ducks is what they are. And there's a bunch worldwide. And then, the, and then there's the geese, that's a group, swans, ducks, and then there's shell ducks and shell geese, which in North America we don't have any, like common shell ducks, uh, paradise shell ducks in New Zealand, uh, Andean geese. And most of those are real unique. In fact, that, that, that even the geese don't, don't honk and they don't make noise. They hiss. They have a hissing sound. So it, it's an odd, odd hissing sound that they make, particularly in that group. So I found that super interesting that you got a duck and a goose that doesn't sound like a duck or a goose. You know, they make hissing sounds and some pretty pretty odd noises like that. So I would say that's the most interesting because there's a lot of ducks. It seems like that in every continent, I went to every continent but Antarctica, and there seems to be what would be a mallard counterpart in most every continent. Like, for instance, in Asia, it's it's a um, an Indian spot-billed duck. And in the Philippines, it's a Philippine duck. And in China, it's an um, eastern spot-billed. And so on. They all sound pretty much like mallards. And it seems like there's a pintail almost in most most continents, which is like the yellow-billed pintail and white-cheeked pintail in South America. And they whistle just like our pintail. So there's a lot of commonalities, and I found that pretty interesting, too. There's three widgeon in the world, and they all whistle. You know, there's the, the American widgeon, the Eurasian widgeon, uh, and then the chiole, uh, or southern widgeon. And they all whistle. So... There's a lot of commonality too, but the, the shell ducks and the shell geese were real interesting to me because they don't they don't quack or or sound like a goose. So that was cool to you know, and I hadn't seen many of those either before. Then the other thing with with birds is the the rating 
or mating rituals. So did you, what out of all of that was probably the most interesting? I mean, because there's bound to be some rituals that go on that are pretty interesting in, in some of those species. Oh, yeah, yeah, there really are. I mean, I've always been, that's one of the things that I always was gravitated towards photographing here is that, um, I mean, most people don't realize that most pairing of ducks in North America, like pintail or, or shovelers or mallards or gadwall, all occur in the winter. The majority of that occurs, it doesn't occur in the spring. Now, what happens in the spring is the unpaired birds, they will pair up. But, for instance, most gadwall are paired by Thanksgiving. And, and think about it. I mean, if you're a duck hunter... When's the last time you saw a flock of gadwall in December? You haven't because they don't exist anymore. They're all paired up. Um, and then on the other hand is, is that if you're a duck hunter, you know that shovelers in November, they don't have any kind of plumage. They look ratty because they come into plumage real late and then they don't pair until January, February. And one of the things that I always thought was, was really, really cool and that I photograph a lot is courtship flights. And that is when you have one hen and being chased by anywhere from two or three males to I photographed them where there's 20 males chasing, you know, one hen. And it's interesting that one of my favorites is, is Northern Shoveler. I mean, and there's one of my favorite pictures in the book is, in fact, of a courtship flight of Northern Shovelers. And because they really get with it. And when they're in color, you know, even though they're the spoony, right, that's kind of looked down upon by some duck hunters, they really are a spectacular looking duck. And they have a really a cool courtship display. And I found that worldwide. There was, I photographed courtship displays of um, a pintail, yellow bill pintail in South America, uh, also white cheek pintail in South America, and then what they call it red billed teal. But they're really a pintail counterpart in Africa doing courtship flights. So the courtship flights are really cool. Then the other one that there's a really interesting are the ruddy ducks of the world. They all have, you know, they do that head bob um, kind of a thing. And, and many of the ruddy ducks around the world. And there seems to be a ruddy duck type in every continent as well. There's two in South America. There's one in Europe. There's one in, in Africa. And they do similar kind of behaviors. So there's some, those are cool uh, behaviors that, that the ruddies do. So there's a whole bunch of different, different things. And then the, probably the, the, there's really an odd one called a musk duck, found only in Australia. It's the last duck in the, one of the last ducks in the book. And they're like a ruddy type. But they do a real interesting display where they have a, a pouch on their neck that they inflate, and then they do a, a, a kick with their feet and get all goofy looking. So there, there's a lot of cool stuff like that going on too. And I did make an effort, um, as Mark said, to not just get do ducks on a pond. You know that gets boring after a while. So I really, really made an effort to try to get ducks on a pond for sure, but also to get courtship activity and behaviors. And to get as much flying as I could, because really, with the photos that I've had published, whether it be DU or Wildfowl Magazine or whatever, I think that that's probably what has helped me the most, is that I really, really concentrate on flying stuff. And that's what, you know, I think a lot of hunters and non-hunters are drawn to. So I tried to include just as much of that as I possibly could. Tell me about the courtship flight. Is that something where the male is trying to impress while they're in flight, or is that more of just okay, I found a female, I'm going to join this, this group. No, no, and then the thing is, is that usually it's an unpaired female with multiple unpaired males. And like I said, I've seen 20 mallards chasing one hen. I've seen the same with gadwall. Pintails normally don't have that many. Widgeon do it too. And it basically it's an unpaired female and let's just say 10 unpaired males. And what they do is that they're, the female leads this group. So from a photographic standpoint, it's always easier to photograph because you just watch the hen. You don't have to worry about watching the, the drakes because they're going to go exactly where... And they do all this aerial acrobatics. And after they do that a number of times, then they'll land. And then they'll do some courtship activities on the water. And at some point within that process, which is a combination of aerial flight and on-the-water behaviors, then she will pick one of those. And then that pair will then fight off the others for a little while until they just say, well, this isn't happening, so I'm going to go find somebody else. And that's generally the process that occurs, is that once she makes that pair bond with that male, and it's her choice, then that pair, because the other guys at that point don't know what's going on, really. 
and then they, they, the, that pair will collectively push those other males away, and then they figure it out. So is so that something kind of, that you could witness in a morning? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, if there's certain places here where I can go out and see, you know, 50 courtship flights in one morning because it's such a constant activity. It's just nonstop at the right time of year. If you go, you know, like, for instance, you're looking for gadwells in January, they're all prepared. With mallards, listen, because some of the most beautiful pictures, and uh, you guys follow Pacific Waterfowl. You guys know John Timmer, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so John had a, a really pretty picture of a male and a female flying the other day on Instagram. So if if the most common thing is a mallard that we can photograph and just capturing that aerial acrobat type stuff, when should people factor on going out for mallards to photograph that courtship? Well, the courtship for mallards, I mean, the primary time that it occurs here in the Central Valley is that it really starts about the 1st of November and most of the mallards are paired by Christmas. So at so that's the period of time. But then what happens is, is that during the course of the rest of the winter, <coughs> there's going to be some pair bonds that, that either, more, normally they don't dissolve. But what happens is, is that, you know, the male gets shot, right? Or, or there are some pair bonds that, that dissolve over the course of the winter. So there's, and there's a few females that just don't, just refuse to pair during the winter. So what happens is in the spring, you're going to have another real burst of courtship activity, which is frankly more frantic than it is in the winter because they're getting close to the breeding season. And that's when you see the 20 mallards after one hen because the ma there's a disproportionate number of, of males and females in, in every most duck populations. And there's always more, more males than there are females. So there's a bunch of these males that aren't paired. The other thing is, is that maybe the male that was doing the courtship in November was a first year male and he wasn't as didn't have as good a plumage and he wasn't he'd never done this before but then over the winter he gets more seasons because he's been in about 50 chases you know 50 courtship flights unsuccessfully so he's you know he's on the ragged edge in the spring that's why you get you know more frantic courtship flights in the spring and you do get them but they're not all in the spring like most people think a lot of duck hunters you know they just think that uh, you know all the breeding and courtship the bonding occurs in the spring, and it doesn't. It occurs much in the, a lot of it in the winter, except for ruddy ducks. There's the one exception. As you see a ruddy in the winter, they're all brown, right? When a mallard has a beautiful green head, a ruddy's brown, and they don't come into plumage till real late, March and April. So their breeding season is really, really late as far as their pairing, and they don't have this winter. Like a mallard that pairs in November 15th is going to stay with that female until June or May, or whatever. So they have a long-term pair bond, whereas the reddies, they'll find a female mate, and she goes off and nests. So it's a very short, short um, pair bond. And are the reddy ducks the ones that end up with the blue beak? Yes. They have a, you know, reddish, uh, you know, they have a white cheek past the blue bill and the, the reddish colored body. That's oh, a reddy duck. So I need to call it, a, I'm so bad. It's a bill, not a beak. Well, it can be either one. It's a, oh, okay. you know, good. And it's interesting, too, because, and Gary hasn't touched on it at all, but from a photography standpoint, I've spent some time, my fair share of time, photo, trying to photograph waterfowl in flight. Just just in pairs and singles is difficult enough. But then trying to do it with the courtship flights and to get good backgrounds and to get the light right and to get everything to come together, it, it's, not a, it's not an easy thing. And you don't see a lot of, in my opinion, really good courtship flights out there floating around, you know, the social media pages and stuff. So, I mean, the ones I've seen in this book are incredible, um, and it's not an easy thing to do. So, Well, I don't it think is, I knew it, what a courtship flight was until this conversation. Oh, really? There you go. Now, now you know. <laughs> yeah, so now I should be able to go down. So <laughs> I've, I've photographed flying ducks because it's a blast, right? It's just so hard to get that, exactly what you just said, Jason. So I love doing it, but I, don't, I didn't know the behavior. I just haven't done that much study into it. But what I always found is if I could find a pond, and this doesn't happen anymore in Colorado. We don't get enough cold weather to have ponds freeze. But if I could find a pond that only had a little bit of water, that's when I was always going to get my flight shots because I knew that they were going to come to this spot eventually. So if I just hung out and got the light right, that was going to be the money. But now ponds don't freeze, and so I haven't really done much of it in the last couple of years. 
Yeah. Well, you know, the main thing is, is you got to find the concentration of birds and, and then, like you say, you know, just hang out and, and hope that that courtship comes. And, and, you know, it is tougher photography. It really is. But when you get them, I mean, it's a big reward because not everybody has good ones. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good waterfowl photographers out there, you know, and you see them on social media. And I think that, you know, it, all of us try pretty hard and spend a lot more time in the field than, than people ever, ever imagine. I mean, I can't tell you how many hours, thousands and thousands of hours I've spent in hip boots. <laughs> and not hip boots, but waders, because I don't wear hip boots, but waders, you know, out in the marsh. And, and typically, you know, uh, and I make a, a trip most years to South Dakota in March because you get that big migration coming through. And you do get courtship flights and a lot of variety, uh, you know, so that's kind of a hot spot I hit all the time. I'm here in the Central Valley, which is real good uh, for a lot of species uh, close by. I go to the East Coast fairly, you know, not every year, but, you know, a bunch of years because there's stuff on the East Coast like black ducks I can't get here. So, you know, I was even doing that before the book, and then you just, I took that general concept and got crazy and made it worldwide. <laughs> I'm glad That's you did. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what about redheads? Are they common? I mean, I love redheads. They're just beautiful. And it's one of the first pictures I ever got published. Is that something that's North America wide, or is that something that's just certain spots? Well, redheads <clears throat> redheads nest primarily in the prairie pothole, uh, you know, northern, north central U.S. and in the prairie potholes of Canada. The majority of them nest there. Uh, there is some scattered nesting throughout the West. Uh, there's a little bit in Nevada. There's some in Idaho, uh, more scattered. There's even a few in, in north, northern California at Klamath, in the Klamath Basin. Um, I've been up there photographing females with young. So there are scattered populations in the West, the majority in the prairie pothole. But they're interesting in the fact that they're really not found in any flyway except for the central flyway and a little bit in the Mississippi because 85% of the population goes to the Laguna Madre of South Texas and, and, and northern Mexico. So every redhead in the, in the country, and, and redheads are not like Pintail that are found. Pintail are found in Asia. Pintail are found in Europe. So are mallards. Greater scop, for instance, or circumpolar, found in many, many countries. Redheads are an American species only, just like canvasbacks. And and eighty five percent of the population goes to the Laguna Madre. In most of the really good shots I've got on the wintering grounds, where they highly concentrate, have been um, in the Laguna Madre of Mexico, south of the border in Tamaulipas. And there's some. And they're eating mostly shoal grass, and they're mostly in salt water. So their diet is almost exclusively shoal grass in the winter, and they're going to these places that have that particular kind of food, and they're a duck that concentrates. So, you know, it's not uncommon to see a flock of 5,000, you know. Or when you're hunting them there, I've had, you know, 100 come to the decoys. So they're, they're a very cool duck. Okay, one more. Sorry, guys. All right. What about mergansers? Did you ever try to do underwater with mergansers? Just because that is quite the spectacle, or did it, it was everything in the air or no, uh, on do, land? Yeah, I didn't do any underwater stuff. I mean, I actually have some underwater gear that I use for uh, you know fishing. You know, put a, put a camera in a housing and just hold it under the water with you know hope the fish is come. You get it close enough, and I've got some pretty good stuff. But I didn't try to do that because most of the, that stuff you've ever seen is in a tank. You know, they're captive birds in a tank, and that which you can set that up. So I didn't do that. But, you know, so everything is going to be on land or on a pond or flying or, I mean, I got a few weird things like, you know, ducks tipping up or diving, you know, where they're just entering the water and so on. But I didn't try any underwater stuff. So there you go for somebody. <laughs> I think it'd be impossible. Like you said, I don't know how the heck you would get. Really cool because it's got to be awesome to watch underwater to watch them again. Well, you know, the problem with underwater stuff is the water has to be crystal clear. You know, it's like taking a picture, you take a picture of a trout in a crystal clear stream, but you try to take your picture of a bass, there isn't any bass water for large bass <laughs> that's clear enough for you to get a good underwater photo, right? So, if you've seen you know, mergansers diving, most of that I, I believe is going to be in you know, where they put them in a, in a tank with a glass, you know, side to it, and they're photographing through the glass. I mean, I've seen some cool pictures, but I never, that, that was just too far beyond what I had time for. <laughs> right, right. 
No, I think just for as a photographic challenge for a lot of listeners, that would be one of those things that, you know, and I, I think you could play around with GoPros and you're not going to get stills oh, yeah, you that way, that but sure. you could probably get some cool video that way. Yeah. I think, I think you qualify to have uh, Johnny Cash song written about you. Just, <laughs> just list the countries. You've been everywhere, man. <laughs> I know, I know I've said it before, but. It's an incredible reference tool for anybody interested in waterfowl and well worth the price. Something you look to. And, and again, there's so many species I had learned about that I already knew about, but so many more I had no idea existed. Such cool looking birds around this planet. And it really gives a global appreciation for that. So the monumental task that you undertook, hats off to you and, and to your success with it. Super congratulations. And I hope everybody who's into this eats it up and these organizations should get behind it and how you outlined you did it and the cause and the importance of the conservation aspect to you is uh, wonderful to hear we will put a, a link in the show notes to your book so we'll you know everybody he, you talked about your website but we'll go ahead and put that on our web page so all you have to do is click a link and it'll go right to the book Okay, cool. I appreciate that. You know, for those looking for exercise in the wintertime, if you're not out, if it's <laughs> snowy, go. you pick the book up off the coffee table, you look at it, and put it back down. You do that 10 times, it's like doing your bicep curls. <laughs> there you go. Incredible book. Where else can they find you? You are on social media as well, Gary, right? People can find you on Instagram. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm on, the only one I'm on is uh, Instagram, and that's uh, Gary underscore Kramer with a K underscore photography so that's uh on instagram and what i've tried to do over really the last four years and that's the main reason why i started was to try to post as many of these photos as i made this journey you know i'd go to a place come back and post three or four photos five photos from that trip indicate where it was from and i think what it did is that it really was wonderful in building followers because people got kind of hooked on the fact is like okay what's the next thing this guy's going to come up with and, and I think it, it worked. And then, so the first place I, I announced the book w was on Instagram and, uh, and got a number of sales. And the second thing that came out, which was super fortunate, uh, and I got to have hats off to Ducks Unlimited, is they, in the November, December issue, they ran an eight page spread and published 30 of the photos from the book uh, in that issue of Ducks Unlimited. And that's, and I've got some tremendous response from that. And if I'm not mistaken, that may have, that just may have put me in a situation to where I don't know if anybody's ever had, I had five other photos in that issue. So I had 35 in that issue, which I don't know if anybody ever has had 35. I sure have, haven't uh, before. So it was really, DU kind of came through. CWA Magazine, California Waterfowl Association did a story too in their uh, fall issue. And uh, Delta's going to do something. And Wildfowl as well. So... You know, the people are, are really helping me out with, with that whole idea and helping out the conservation organizations, too, with that. So it's, you it, got to go to your Instagram guys. page. Yeah, it's, it's just look. I mean, you can learn a lot of species just on your Instagram. Yep. Holy smokes. Gary, so serious, serious question here. And I and I, you know, Mark alluded to it earlier. And I, there may be an opportunity here. Maybe I'm just missing the boat, but. I really do. Th I mean, other than the size of this thing, this is an incredible field guide. Have you thought about doing a digital version of this to for folks to you have on their phones and use I, in the field? I really haven't, but I haven't. But that probably is not a bad idea because, as you say, I mean, it's a coffee table book that you can't take anywhere. Right. <laughs> it weighs about eight pounds, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's just there were so many. Pa well, the other thing I didn't want to do is that there was some early thought about splitting it in two volumes. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted a coffee table book, large format coffee table book where I could have some larger photos, not little tiny things. Right. And then also, um, you know, so it ended up being a giant thing. But digitally, that might make some sense. And the other, you know, to be able to uh, to do it that way, and then you'd have it on a tablet or you'd have it wherever your, you know, your computer, whatever. So right. that's something that, that I should consider, and that's something I will now. But I hadn't even thought of it, so thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> That I did, Jason. <laughs> right, no worries. Sign me up for a copy. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. Great. I think that's a phenomenal idea. But sell out of the book, not to put people off on the digital, then then do the digital. Or later on. This this the hard the hard copy is something to have just for the quality. And and there's so much depth to the knowledge in there. 
So it's been a pleasure to meet you, Gary. Thank you for putting up with the patience of getting on our tech side of things tonight and for joining us on this conversation. It's been a, th a thrill to hear your experiences. And I know we just kind of scratch the surface on it and I look forward to I have actually read the, that last part of the book with the photography stories so I'm going to dive into that over the days ahead and, and learn more about what this book experiences were for you. You can find more Gary's information on our website at wildandexposed.com. Make sure to check this episode out on YouTube as well and follow along and you can watch the conversation there and see the book as we have it and hold it up at different times that way. And as I said, Gary's links are on our website. Also, check out our shop on the website. The Wild and Exposed merch is there. And new stuff coming out all the time. Thanks to Michael Morrow's planning and his new designs for t-shirts. So he's shaking his head. <laughs> They're good, man. They're awesome. Always new stuff there. It helps support what we do here at the podcast. And until next time, thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday. Nothing's gonna get in our way. We will be the biggest band in town. Mm -mm. Round and round the world we'll go.